Раф, один, Эвен Исраэль, Штензальц, Зихрано Цадик Левраха. The thirteen petalled rose, a discourse on the essence of Jewish existence and belief. Translated by Ihuda Anegbi. Magid Books. Chapter Divine Manifestation. The Holy One, blessed be He, has any number of names. All of those names, however, designate only various aspects of divine manifestation in the world, in particular as those are made known to human beings. Above and beyond this variety of designation it is divine essence itself, which has not and cannot have a name. We call this essence or God in himself by a name that is itself a paradox, the infinite blessed be he. This term, then, is meant to apply to the divine essence in itself, which cannot be called by any other name, since the only name that can be applied to the very essence of God must include both the distant and the near, indeed everything. Now, as we know, in the realms of abstract thought, such as mathematics and philosophy, infinity is that which is beyond measure and beyond grasp, while at the same time the term is limited by its very definition to being a quality of something finite. Thus, for example, there are many things in the world, such as numbers, that may have infinity as one of their attributes, and yet also be limited, either in function or purpose, or in their very nature. But when we speak of the infinite, blessed be here, we mean the utmost of perfection and abstraction, that which encompasses everything and is beyond all possible limits. The only thing we are permitted to say about the infinite, then, would involve the negative of all qualities. For the infinite is beyond anything that can be grasped in any terms, either positive or negative. Not only is it impossible to say of infinite that he is in any way limited or that he is bad, one cannot even say the opposite, that he is vast or he is good, just as he is not matter, he is not spirit, nor can he be said to exist in any dimension meaningful to us. The dilemma posed by this meaning of infinity is more than a consequence of inadequacy of the human mind. It represents a seemingly unbridgeable gap, a gap that cannot be crossed by anything definable. There would therefore seem to be an abyss stretching between God and the world, and not only the physical world of time, space and gravity, but also the spiritual worlds, no matter how sublime, confined, as each one of within the boundaries of its own definition. Creation itself becomes a diving paradox. To bridge this abyss, the infinite keeps creating the world. His creation is not the act of forming something out of nothing, but the act of revelation. Creation is an emanation from the diving light. Its secret is not the coming into existence of something new, but the transmutation of the diving reality into something defined and limited into a world. This transmutation involves a process or a mystery of contraction. God hides himself, putting aside his essential infiniteness and withholding his endless light to the extent necessary in order that the world may exist. 
Within the actual diving light, nothing can maintain its own existence. The world becomes possible only through the special act of diving, withdrawal or contraction. Such diving, non-being or concealing is thus the elementary condition for the existence of that which is finite. Still, even though it appears as an entity in itself, the world formed and sustained by the diving power manifested in this primal essence. The manifestation takes the form of ten spherot, fundamental forces or channels of diving flow, and those spheros, which are the means of diving revelation, are related to the primary diving light as a body is related to the soul. They are in the nature of instrument or a vehicle of expression, as for a mode of creation in other dimension of existence. Or the ten spheros can also be seen as arrangement or configuration resembling an upright human figure. Each of those main limbs corresponds to one of the spheros. The world does not, therefore, relate directly to the hidden Godhead, which is the imagery is like the soul in relation to the human semblance of the spheros. Rather, it relates to the diamond manifestation when and how this manifestation occurs in the ten spheros, just as man's true soul, his inapprehensible self, is never revealed to other but manifest itself through his mind, emotions, and body, so is the self of God not revealed in his original essence, except through the ten spheros. The ten spheros taken together constitute a fundamental, all-inclusive reality. Moreover, the pattern of this reality <coughs> is organic. Each of the spheros has unique function, complements each of the others, is essential for realization or fulfillment of the others and of the whole. Because of their profound many-sidedness, ten spheres seem to be shrouded in mystery, and there are indeed so many apparently unconnected levels of meaning to each, levels, moreover, appearing to be unconnected, that a mere listing of their names does not adequately convey their essence. To say that the first sphere, Keter, crown, is the basic diving will and also the source of all delight and pleasure only touches the surface. As is true with Chochma, wisdom, which is intuitive, instantaneous knowledge, while Bina, understanding, tends more to logical analysis. That knowledge is different from both, being not only accumulation of the summation of that which is known, but a sort of eleventh sphere, belonging and yet not belonging to the ten. Hesed, grace, is thus the fourth sphere and is the irrepressibly, irrepressibly expanding impulse or Gedula, greatness, of love and growth. Gvura, power, is restraint and concentration, control as well as fear and awe. While Tiferes, beauty, is combination of harmony, truth, compassion. Netzach, eternity, is conquest of the capacity for overcoming. Hod, splendor, can also be seen as persistence or holding on. And Yisod, foundation, is, among other things, the vehicle, the carrier from one thing or condition to another. Malchus, kingdom, the tenth and the last sphere is besides sovereignty or rule, the word and the ultimate receptacle. Keter, Bina, Chochma, Dat, Gvura Hesed, Tiferet, Chod Netzach, Yisod, Malkus. 
all the spheres are infinite in their potency, even though they are finite in their essence. They never appear separately, each in the pure state, but always in the some sort of combination in a variety of forms. And every single combination or detail of such a combination expresses different revelation. The great sum of all those spheres in their relatedness constitutes the permanent connection between God and his world. This connection actually operates two ways, for the world can respond and even act on its own. On the one hand, the ten spheres are responsible for universal law and order, what we might call the workings of nature in the world. As such, they might and descend contracting, changing forms as they go from one world to another until they reach our physical world, which is the final station of the manifestation of diving power. On the other hand, the events that occur in our world continuously influence the ten spheres, affecting the nature and quality of the relations between the downpouring light and power and the recipients of this light and power. An old allegory illustrates this influence by depicting the world as a small island in the middle of the sea inhabited by birds. To provide them with sustenance, the king has arranged intricate network of channels through which the necessary food and water flow. So long as the birds behave as they are endowed by nature to behave, singing and soaring through the air, the flow of plenty proceeds without interruption. But then the birds begin to play in the dirt and peck at the channels. The channels get blocked or broken and cease to function properly, and the flow from above is disrupted. So too does the island that is our world depend on the power functioning of the spheres, and then they are interfered with, the system is disrupted, and disrupting factors themselves suffer the consequences. In this essence, the entire order of the spheres with its laws of action and reaction is in many ways mechanical. Nevertheless, man, who is the only creature capable of free action in the system, can cause alterations of varying degrees in the pattern and the operation. For everything man does has significance, and evil act will generally cause some disruption or negative reaction in the vast system of spheros, and a good act correct or raise things to the higher level. Each of the reactions extends out into all of the worlds and come back into our own, back upon ourselves in one form or another. In this vast sublime order, the mitzvahs study and practice of Torah teaching, prayer, love, repentance, constitute only details of guidelines. The mitzvahs teach us how certain acts, thoughts, ways of doing things affect spheros and bring about a desirable combination of blessedness and plenty, making the world better. In fact, before the performance of every mitzvah, there are certain words to be said aloud, words intended to cause a great abundance to flow in from the higher worlds in order to illuminate our souls, which means that every mitzvah has a specific essence through which it influences the system of the world and creates certain kind of connection between the worlds and men. Thus, even for from many points of view, our world is small. It can be seen as the point of intersection of all the other worlds 
principally because of the power of human beings, creatures possessed of free will to change the fixed order of things. It is for our world where a kind of control room from which the ten spheros in their various possible combinations can be made to operate. A transgression, that is, disruption of order in the system, has two results. First, it causes a kind of short circuit and skews or distorts the descent of diving plenty. Second, the shock set off by this short circuit stimulates the world of the clipos, the outer shells, and causes them, in turn, to set off negative charge within a particular system that belongs to the life of the transgressor. This is what it meant by the reward and punishment that are said to follow on every action of a human being. Nor is the only deed that so affects the system of the spheres, it's also a thought, an intention, or any of the various steerings of the human soul. For instance, whenever a person prays, whether he prays in the prescribed manner which is oriented toward the higher worlds, or whether he engaged in private prayer, uttered aloud, or merely contemplated in the heart, he is able to influence the order of events. In fact, man's spontaneous inward motions, those that have nothing to do with either his overt action or his conscious thoughts, frequently reach up to and act on his higher levels. When a man prays to be cured of sickness, for example, he is asking for grace, for a change in a vast network of system, from the fixed system that apportions good and evil as a whole to those secondary and fluctuating system from which this sends the physical real, which its own portion of pains and miseries. He is, in other words, requesting rearrangement within a huge complex of interlocking orders, both in the higher worlds and the world of nature. This pattern of diving manifestation and human relation to it may seem to be mechanical in its determinism, but it is depicted with far more personal symbolic imagery in the scriptural sources. That is to say, in the various religious and philosophical works of the Jewish tradition. A variety of allegorical signs and figures of speech are used to signify the same thing, so that we may read of the eye of God scanning the face of earth, the ears of God hearing all sounds of the Holy One, blessed be He, being pleased or angry, smiling or weeping, all those, of course, relate to the pattern of his manifestation through the ten spheros in their various configurations, analogous as the spheros are in the parts, to the organs and limbs of the human body, man being made in the image of God in his body as well as in his soul. We thus have a paradigm of the essential relationships in the universe if not of the essences themselves, and we may speak of the right hand of God as the force of power that gives, that pours out the abundance that helps and loves, and we may speak of the left hand as the force that restrains and protects, reduces and re inflicts, recognizing harmony or the living connection between everything and every other in the system of spheros. Thus, too, then prophets describe their sublime vision of God. He is revealing himself in the spheros. They have to present the vision in a human context in order to be true to its emotional significance for man. Their descriptions may be considered 
as allegorical frameworks, using man as a metaphor for the supreme, both in the human details they employ and in the use the idea of man as a complex entity, microcosm, the human hand then becomes analogous to hesed, grace, which in another configuration can represent, be represented as water or light or any other variation of a symbolic metamorphosis. Therefore, too, when someone who prays or performs mitzvah relates to the higher system, he may impose images upon that system, metamorphosis of the same higher force to the point of regarding God as human-like figure sitting on the throne, every feature of which expresses a revelation within the spheros in a different world, one above the other. Even for the order of forces is almost infinite in its immensity and complexity, seems mechanical and automatic, and even for what seems mechanical includes not only matter and the laws of nature, but also the operations of laws beyond nature, of good and evil, intention and prayer, thought and feeling, this order is nevertheless transfused with the flow of divine plenty. And in this order, man, though only a tiny part of the whole, is also an effectual, meaningful actor in it. The fact that man is only a very small detail, a dot and less than a dot as against the infinite, is balanced by the fact that it is precisely he in his smallness who gives each of the parts its significance. Since there is an order of causes and influences in the prime mover of all the worlds, every single person can, in his deeds, thoughts and aspirations reach to every one of those points of existence. Not only is man free to act on the system, each of his deeds has in all the worlds, in terms of space and time, and of the supreme or ultimate reality, immeasurable significance. In contrast to all the automatic patterns or forces functioning in the cosmos, man alone moves independently within the system. He alone is important to the manifestations because he can change them, cause them to move from one level to another. Furthermore, man dwelling as he does in two different worlds and undergoing profound inner struggles is given a chance to rise far beyond the level of our existence and the place in which he spiritually finds himself and to act on higher worlds within, without end. Precisely because the diving is apprehended as infinite, not a finite force, everything in the cosmos whether small or large, is only a small part of the pattern so that there is no difference in weight or gravity between any one part and another. The movement of man's finger is important or unimportant as the most terrible catastrophe for as against the infinite both are of the same dimension. Just as the infinite can be defined as unlimited in the sense of being beyond everything, so he can be defined as being close to and touching everything. Here is the point of the personal human contact, for in spite of the vastness and order of all the systems, the independent acts of man, his misfos and his transgressions, cannot be explained in terms of either of mechanics or other, on the other hand, of magic.
when one relates only to spheros, one is not related to anything real. For deeds or thoughts do not operate by themselves separate from infinite, he who is the very life of the worlds. All the systems of the sp ten spheros, even though they carry out the laws of nature and beyond nature, have nothing real in themselves. In relation to the infinite light himself, they are less than a nothingness, clothed or covered by appearance of something real. There are only names, designations, points of departure for establishing a relationship, having nothing substantial in themselves, so that prayer, repentance, the cry of man to God, even though they are dependent upon and cut across a limited, deterministic system, neither work upon nor even address that system. When man reaches certain heights, he learns more about God, the order and arrangement of things, relationship between one action and another, and the power and significance of law. Nevertheless, in the last resort, the relationship to the divine is individual. It is completely private affair, relationship of the single man in all his uniqueness or self and personality, oblivious of the infinite distance between himself and God, precisely because God, in his being infinite distant, beyond any possible contact, is himself the one who creates the ways, the means of contact, in which every thought, every tremor of anticipation, desire on the part of men work their way until they reach the Holy One Himself, the infinite, blessed be here. The end of the chapter.